So we shall have the reading from chapter 4 of Colossians, starting at verse 7 and continuing to the end of the book. And that can be found on your small print church Bibles on the page of 985 and on your large print church Bibles on the page of 1170. I'll give you a moment to find those. All right. Colossians 4, starting at verse 7 and continuing to the end of the book. Tychius will tell you all, uh, all about my activities. He is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, our fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a, com have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear witness, for I bear him witness, witness that he has worked hard for you and for all those and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers in Laodicea, and to Nympha, and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfil the ministry that you have received from the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his house. We've arrived at the uh, end of uh, the book of Colossians uh, this morning. Uh, my name's Gary, I'm one of the pastors here. Um, and if you've uh, um, still got the opportunity to uh, grab a, a growth group guide and to um, think about um, how we're unfolding, uh, even these uh, final applications uh, from the book of Colossians as we continue to uh, think about how Paul unfolds what it is to uh, uh, well be in Christ, to be a person in Christ and to be a uh, people in in Christ. Uh, Paul has been writing uh, to the church in Colossae at, uh, uh, from prison. He's never actually been there, uh, but he has a relationship with these people. And uh, uh, in that relationship, his heart has gone out for them because uh, uh, more latterly, apart from their particular interest in him, uh, he's concerned that there are those among them who might be falling uh, prey to a teaching uh, or influences, encouragements to uh, find personal security and corporate security to, to find their uh, understanding of where God's blessings come from uh, somewhere other than the Lord Jesus Christ and the question of uh, uh, where personal fullness as a disciple of Jesus or as a local church comes from uh, was uh, uh, an underlying theme that has uh, been touched on again and again uh, in the message uh, and that we find our fullness in, in the Lord Jesus Christ and Paul's been uh, emphasizing that in a number of ways. Eyes. 
Now, uh, it's a time of year when we uh, uh, have farewells on our minds and uh, even as we come to this uh, section of uh, Colossians today, uh, this is, is like a goodbye. It's Paul's signing off to the people uh, to whom he's been writing. He doesn't know his own circumstances or future uh, and so he's uh, really uh, giving them uh, his own words of blessing and his own words of uh, final encouragement. Uh, farewells can be tricky things. Uh, there's, uh, uh, and as I said, this time of year, the farewells are sort of on the agenda. Uh, uh, there are folk who, um, even in this town, uh, even in our church, are moving on, uh, and they'll be moving on uh, well for. Uh, yeah, relocating and, and uh, won't be back uh, in terms of being a regular part of our fellowship here and there are others who will be going away and we'll be seeing them again at some points in the new year and you know that your farewells to those sorts of people are going to be different if you're expecting to see someone again in the middle of January but if you're uncertain about when you'll have regular uh, fellowship again with other people the, the farewell ha has a different tone. Now, you might think, uh, or we might be tempted to believe, that these are just a few cursory additions that Paul is placing at the end of his letter, but uh, really they continue to unfold and apply uh, the reality of the truths that he's been teaching all along. Uh, he's been unfolding in the letter how uh, the Lord Jesus is the, the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent in, in terms of speaking about how everything was made and created uh, uh, by him and through him and for him and how his resurrection demonstrates that he will be the Lord of, of all creation. Uh, we're to see that Jesus is firstly understood by, well, all of creation but by us as his disciples uh, as Lord. And then uh, in chapter 2 he uh, speaks about as we've received Christ Jesus the Lord, uh, so walk in him. And here again we saw the, the theme of the letter being unfolded in the in the sense of liberty that we have as we uh, trust in our Lord and uh, the what it is to know that all of God's blessings and all of God's life and all of God's encouragement come to us because we're related to Jesus uh, uh, not as Paul was warning against uh, falling into uh, well the, the idea of uh, mistaking um, legalistic practices where you uh, uh, think that certain rituals are going to gain you the, the blessings of God uh, or the spirit speculative um, uh, ideas of mysticism where you uh, are driven by and seeking out some form of experience or someone who's had an experience and thinking that they're going to be the the what will mediate the blessings of God to you or or even uh, ascetic practices where you are bargaining with God well I'll deny myself this or that or the other and because of that I can know the blessings of God uh, uh, Jesus uh, is our fullness and he is our life and he is our liberty and so beyond that uh, we see that the victory that we have in Jesus when Christ who is your life appears then you also will appear with him in glory and the uh, complete victory that is ours. Uh, even when it doesn't feel like it, Paul's writing from prison. He's writing to people whose circumstances are uncertain and could be uh, marginalised in many ways because of their following Jesus. Uh, but he's telling them that uh, uh, the victorious Christian life uh, is not a set of disciplines or practices. It's not a location that you go to. Uh, it's not even a group of people that you hang out with. The victorious Christian life is purely and simply being related to Jesus and being united to him. That is what victory looks like because when Jesus comes at the end of the age and every knee bows and every tongue confesses him as Lord, uh, we, well it's not that we share in that but it's that we're part of it. We're part of his lordship. We're part of his winning. And so uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen how uh, all of that experience of, of Jesus as Lord, as Jesus as our liberty, as Jesus as our life, uh, comes out in, in our labour, in what we do, in how we relate at home, in how we relate in our workplaces and uh, schools, uh, clubs, societies, groups, in all our relationships. Uh, we've seen that uh, Jesus is the one uh, who empowers us and he is our uh, not only our agenda he's our, our mandate he is the reason why we do what we do uh, and he is well uh, he tells us what we do 
uh, in terms of making disciples uh, and in terms of being a light for him in darkness that others might see and know uh, the freedom that, and the uh, fulfilment that we have uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of this is marked with thanksgiving, uh, a deep appreciation for what Jesus has done for us and knowing that in him we experience all the fullness of uh, God's blessing and God's love, God's presence and God's power. Uh, it's all poured out into our lives to the point where our lives can't contain it. They overflow and, and overflowing, uh, they become a source that points to life uh, for others, uh, for those around us. In this, uh, uh, Paul is then speaking uh, after having spoken about relationships among families and speaking about relationships in, uh, outside of families but in households. Uh, he names some individuals um, in uh, verse uh, 7. He speaks about Tychicus. Uh, we'll tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Uh, we understand in all of this that the letter that's been written and composed, uh, Tychicus's main job is to make sure that it gets from Paul uh, to the Colossians. He's uh, basically the ancient equivalent of Australia Post. And, uh, uh, well, most of the things that Australia Post handle do get to us sooner or later. Uh, uh, Tychicus has that job uh, but we see that uh, Paul uh, refers to him as as a minister as a, a loyal servant it's not simply that he was an an errand person who uh, had no further interest in what was being conveyed than to simply make sure it was uh, brought from its point of origin to its point of destination uh, but his life was a living embodiment and a living expression of everything that was contained in the letter uh, what Paul had written and what Tychicus's life expressed uh, matched up. And so uh, in that, Paul says, uh, you may, so that you may know what I'm doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. Uh, all of the cohort who were gathered around Paul uh, while he's in prison uh, are not simply... Um, well, they're not simply extras. Uh, you see that uh, you think of Paul, you think of him in, in an apostolic role and function, uh, and you think that the others are simply there to make up the numbers. Uh, but in every body of believers, uh, every individual uh, has, has an evangelistic and a ministry function. It, it is one thing to say that I'm a practical person, and friends, um, in terms of the service life of our congregation, uh, practical people are very much needed and appreciated. Otherwise, um, nothing would get done. But we don't hold uh, the idea of being practical and of uh, being someone whose life shares the gospel as being separate and distinct, as if there's um, the people who do things and then the people who uh, are engaged in ministering or gospeling or sharing the gospel. Uh, Tychicus uh, was just as capable of moving uh, this correspondence from, from origin to point of destination, uh, but he was able to give an explanation of the hope that was within him. He was able to tell people what it was to follow Jesus, why he follows Jesus, and how and interpret how the circumstances in which they found themselves uh, were uh, their experience of God's blessing and God's presence and God's power and God's love. And so uh, Tychicus uh, would tell them all about the activities. He's a beloved brother and a faithful minister. Rather than being someone that Paul needed to keep with him, uh, he was able to send him. And in sending him, Tychicus was prepared to go. Sometimes our, um, well, sometimes our presence isn't always where our hearts would absolutely have us be. But in the cause and the context of the gospel, that's no loss. It's no injustice against us to have to move and to have to uh, be God's people somewhere else. 
That's why Paul had sent him, as he says, for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. In this, uh, while in prison, Paul's genuine overwhelming concern was not for himself, but it was for this church, this church that he'd never been to. Tychicus was not someone that he was able to do without. He's not someone that he could spare in that sense. It's not that he was unimportant. But it's just that Paul valued the ministry to the church in, in Colossae more than he valued his own fleeting comforts in prison. That's the... the idea that of the fullness that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Onesimus, their faithful and beloved brother who is, who is one of you, they'll tell you everything that's taking place there. They're going to hear about the, the imprisonment and the chains. Onesimus is one who we won't touch on so much this morning. Basically his backstory gets the whole, the next letter in the Bible to Philemon. We'll deal with that in and of itself so some other day. Uh, but they're going back so that the church can be encouraged. Uh, we think of what it is to, to come back to a church we've been away from for a while and, and how we try to bring words that are, uh, are encouragements to those who are there. To speak of, um, of, of what builds up to speak of what demonstrates how God's grace has been working in our lives. To have that as part of our thoughts in our daily lives. Uh, it's not simply a report. You know, children will go back to school next year and they'll be asked to write what I did on my holidays and it'll read more like an itinerary list. Maybe it'll even be in order, I don't know. Uh, but the idea is not simply to just list what's happened, but in your heart to know what it is that God's been doing and to be thinking about why he's been doing it. What is it that he's been trying to grow in you? What has he been trying to grow in others? And so um, in this, uh, Paul basically um, in, in Philemon uh, appeals on behalf of Onesimus uh, because he'd become very, very close to him. And in sending him back, uh, and sending him back to an uncertain circumstance, he says that he's sending his very heart. Uh, There's a natural inclination, I think, in people that it's hard to deal, to, to part with the very best that you've got. It's hard. You need to at least think about it. Um, we uh, have a, a culture of, of amazing generosity here. And it's deeply uh, appreciated and uh, those of us who are very privileged to, to see more of those generous interactions than perhaps um, um, what normal uh, people would see uh, are so thankful to God for it. Uh, Paul says he's sending back his very heart as he sends uh, uh, Onesimus, uh, who was a runaway slave, back to the place that he'd run away from. And... Uh, in this, we're, we're appreciating the fact that even though Paul is sending these people away, he, he's never alone. He, he's never feeling lonely in that because he has the presence and the power of God to sustain him. The, the, the cross has brought these people together and because the cross is what's brought them together, uh, they're able to hold on to their physical proximity uh, very loosely while knowing that uh, even when time and distance might part them, it doesn't mean that their heart or their love for each other will diminish. Because it's the love of Christ that has brought them together. 
He speaks about some others uh, who he calls uh, uh, the the men of the circumcision among my fellow workers uh, for the kingdom of God that have been a comfort to him. Uh, In that we're going to hear some names mentioned soon. Uh, We think that by referring to them as the the only men of the circumcision that the ones uh, who he's going to speak about uh, are those from a Jewish background. It might seem that uh, because of circumstances uh, uh, that the Jewish Christians had uh, fallen away or not been able to exercise the same level of support and presence for Paul uh, that uh, his uh, Christian friends from a Gentile background had been able to provide. But still amongst these uh, there were those who were with Paul while he was in prison who were demonstrating uh, what the fullness that they had in Christ was and how they were sustaining and sharing uh, each other's burdens Uh, and each other's cares through a time of great trial. Uh, We hear about Aristarchus, uh, a fellow prisoner, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, uh, Jesus, who's called Justice, Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice. So uh, these three were here uh, together and uh, uh, we're able to uh, perhaps piece together just how close these things are because he talks about Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, uh, uh, perhaps even better phrased as my fellow prisoner of war. There was a a spiritual conflict going on and uh, they were in the middle of it. Uh, One uh, commentator uh, uh, has sort of... uh, posited these uh, ideas of of the extreme closeness. Aristarchus had been one who'd travelled with Paul for some time. Uh, He'd been there during the kerfuffle in Ephesus at the Temple of Diana where things broke out into a riot. Uh, The city was filled with confusion uh, and this is where they were dragged off to prison. Gaius, Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in trouble. They'd got in trouble because they were upsetting the uh, market for idols uh, in in Ephesus around the the temple of Diana. Aristarchus was on the ground there. Aristarchus was also part of the uh, uh, the fateful, um, well it wasn't a three hour cruise, but the fateful boat ride uh, uh, along to Malta there. Uh, and uh, uh, they put to sea accompanied by Aristarchus and uh, we, uh, uh, the Bible has told us, we saw it in the book of Acts, how there was a shipwreck. Uh, Aristarchus had been with Paul and he'd been through what Paul had been through. Uh, In the Bible, uh, Paul writes about these uh, tremendous experiences that he'd been through, how he'd suffered imprisonment, how he'd suffered beatings, how he'd suffered uh, many other physical deprivations and and indignities, but he never suffered them alone. Uh, Aristarchus could have written uh, very similarly about it. Uh, And so uh, we see that uh, uh, this idea of someone who is a, a fellow prisoner who greeted him and uh, um, the, um, the idea is developed or understood that for Aristarchus and, and Luke to um, uh, have been there with, uh, uh, with, with Paul in prison, it's, um, it's possible in, in the culture of the time that they, um, that they might have even had to have identified as his slaves. Uh, in order to be able to be imprisoned or imprisoned with him. Uh, There's contemporary sort of sources that suggest that uh, um, someone who'd travelled to to be imprisoned in Rome, even their wife couldn't go with them. Wives would probably be glad about that. Uh, But the idea was that their slaves were allowed to travel with them and tend to their needs in prison. Uh, It's not that the prison was such a place where all these people could just land and, and hang around. Uh, But these people had uh, come to identify so closely with Paul somehow or other uh, that his prison experience was was literally their prison experience as well. Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, is uh, talked about as well. Uh, And in this we're able to see uh, how God's grace and and how the power of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, uh, invents the concept of of recycling, I suppose, or second chances, uh, uh, even before uh, you might have thought that those sorts of concepts were popular. Uh, Some of you know uh, that uh, uh, Mark was a a cousin, a younger cousin of of Barnabas who'd travelled with uh, uh, Paul. Uh, and uh, he'd been a, a cause of division 
uh, within the apostolic band. We saw this when we looked at the book of Acts. Uh, um, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark on their next uh, tour together with uh, Paul. Uh, Paul thought it best not to take him because he'd withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and not gone with them to work. There arose a sharp disagreement between Barnabas and Paul. Such was the extent that Barnabas went in one direction with Mark and Paul went in another direction with Silas. Uh, Paul had uh, come to the point of view that uh, Mark was a quitter or Mark was not up to the task or, or Mark was in some way unqualified to rejoin the, the, uh, the apostolic tour. And yet, over time, uh, we see that the grace of the gospel uh, and the power of God uh, can restore. It can restore uh, what in human terms might thought to be ruptured and, and broken forever. Uh, there is a power that can not simply unite purpose, but can unite hearts together. And that's uh, part, of the, part of the gospel imperative and part of its energy and power as well. Uh, friends, uh, uh, over the weeks to come, particularly at Christmas, uh, uh, you'll be thinking of, um, um, well, uh, that there are those times when we think of absences. We think of absences because there are those who have left this world and are gone. Uh, and there's a certain sadness of that. Uh, we think of absences for those who would ordinarily be with us, but they're uh, away, travelling or not able to be there this time. Uh, but then there are the absences that we feel because there's a rupture. A rupture in a relationship. A rupture because hearts are not together and things are not right. And those are the, the absences that play on our hearts and minds, perhaps more than any of the others. And you wonder how these things could be put together. Well, in the scriptures, in the case of uh, Paul and, and Mark, uh, we see that the, the power of the gospel uh, can do that. Uh, you see, concerning uh, um, the Mark... Um, Paul was uh, uh, indicating that if he ever turned up in, in, in Colossae that uh, he was to be welcomed. He was to be uh, received as one uh, that he described in another place as, as being useful to him. And we're able to marvel in the fact that what in, in human will would work for division... God in his power works to restore and bring together. Uh, there's a, a, a phrase in, in the prophets, of course, that uh, uh, God can, uh, can restore the years that the, uh, that the locusts have eaten. He can put it back and he can make it better than it was even in the beginning. That's the power. Uh, we see that there's a power of prayer in the gospel. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Jesus, greets you. He's always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. Uh, friends, uh, uh, we uh, talk to folk and perhaps when you're feeling uh, infirm or uh, uh, ill, perhaps when you're uh, in some fear, uh, period of isolation or weakness, you say that there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do uh, and yet it ignores the reality or it doesn't recognise the reality that in the Bible the, the great ministry is the ministry of prayer. It is the great ministry that is available to each and every Christian. And in those prayers it's not simply us praying for what we need but the, the great prayers are the prayers that pray for the needs of others. The prayers that uphold people that you know. The prayers that uphold people that you only know but have never even met. The prayers that uphold the, the cause of the gospel. And this is what Epaphras did. Uh, his great prayers were the prayers for the church in Colossae. Again, I've noted it a few times. Here's Paul not saying, well, you know, everybody should be praying to get me out of prison. <laughs> but he's praying for them. And his band are praying for them. Here are these people in prison who are holding these prayer meetings and it would seem that the number one agenda point on their prayer meetings is not get me out of prison. 
but it's make sure that these other folk who are following the Lord Jesus continue to live free. That's the, the, the heart that was being prayed for. And friends, when we gather together and when we think and when you think about, well, I can't do anything, I don't have time, I, I can't work my schedule out, I, I can't uh, um, um, find the group of people to meet with, or I'm too ill, I can't get out of bed, I can't get out of the house, there's, I'm useless, there's nothing I can do. Don't ignore the ministry of intercession the ministry of prayer. And so in this, uh, uh, the little roll call continues, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, uh, the one who um, uh, was always there, who would uh, sit down with Paul and uh, write out the, the truths of the gospel uh, and then the, the works of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the, of the early Christians. Demas, we'll talk about another day. Uh, but at this point, he's still there. And he's still there as part of the faithful band. And so in, in all of this, uh, we're able to appreciate what Paul's heart is and, and what it is the gospel's doing and, and how perhaps for some of you, you might think that uh, there's a loneliness that hangs over your life and there's a sense of isolation and perhaps even coming here on a Sunday morning only exacerbates that sense. So, uh, friends, uh, uh, it would make sense that if you're feeling uh, lonely in life, that coming here uh, would be the one place that would accentuate that sense of loneliness above all others. And this is the worst place to feel the loneliest because the gospel promises community, the gospel promises relationship, the gospel promises uh, a mutuality and it invites you into that. It invites us to explore what's going on. Uh, uh, Paul speaks to the church, uh, the brothers at Laodicea, to Nympha in the church in her house. When the letter's been read among you, have it read in the church of the Laodiceans. So uh, when it's brought along, uh, the Christians gather together and uh, the, the scriptures are read out. And they read the letters that are sent to the other churches too. And they share the letters that they have as well. And, and we see the, the uh, reality of that in the Bible, where the uh, unique and essential messages of the Christian faith have been preserved by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're to be a people of the word and we're to be a people who understand that the truth of the grace of God is spoken to us and revealed to us uh, in the Bible. 4.17, say to Archippus, see that you fulfil the ministry that you've received in the Lord. Uh, there, there are a couple of lines of thought on this. Um, Archippus might be the fellow who's sort of the pastor amongst the Colossians. Um, people have tried to figure out, is this really Paul sending a letter to a church uh, and then singling one fellow right out the end of it where basically the rest of the church is supposed to say to him, pull up your socks? Um, you know, stick at it. Uh, rather, uh, in terms of the train of the whole letter, uh, it's meant to be a recognition of uh, the church uh, working alongside and encouraging him in the ministry that he was given. And so uh, when uh, Paul uh, instructs them and exhorts them to say, see that you fulfill the ministry that you've received from the Lord, uh, the, the people weren't meant to understand that, that they were separate from that, but rather they were the ministry that he'd received from the Lord. And what they were supposed to be doing was to encourage him prayerfully and in a sense of constructive encouragement about how to carry that ministry out. Paul says, I write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains, grace be with you. Uh, and again, this idea of remember my chains uh, is not to extend a sense of pity to Paul, uh, but it's meant to underline again just the, the reality of where being a faithful disciple of Jesus will lead you. And to not be surprised when you find yourself at those destinations. He says, grace be with you. And that's not just a, a throwaway sign-off. He's, he's in prison 
And in his weakness and in his infirmity, he was able to appreciate that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is more than just the disposition of God. It's more than just the gateway by which we come into God's family. Uh, but he recalls the word that was given to him and uh, uh, that he recorded in Second Corinthians, that in whatever the infliction was in his life, whatever the thorn in the flesh was that he'd received, uh, Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest in me. And in that we understand that grace is, is not simply the disposition of God but grace is the power of God as well. And when you feel that you're weak that's when God's power can flow into your life all the more strongly. It's counterintuitive because we think if we're feeling weak, there must be something wrong with us. But friends, when you're feeling weak, it's the time when you will know exactly what's right with God. And so you'll know where your fullness comes from. Remember my chains, grace be with you. And in that grace, may we all experience and know the fullness of uh, the power of God as it is poured into our lives because we are united with Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word to us today. We pray that you would uh, encourage us. Uh, and Father, particularly for any who might feel isolated, who might feel lonely, who might feel that they're just not experiencing everything that this letter or that the Gospels hold out. Father, as they look to you, might you reveal yourself to them, enliven them, Help them. And Father, draw, draw your people close to them and them close to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.